Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over some quick and dirty chemistry. So some things you absolutely need to know in order to be successful in AP Biology that are about chemistry. So let's get started. Scientists once believed that living organisms were made of a different type of matter than the rest of the universe. They thought there was some like vital force that governed the living world. Of course, they were mistaken, and it was later discovered that we, or all living things, are made of the same elements as the rest of the universe. So that's pretty cool. Now, this is a tool. You might have seen this before. Um, this is our handy-dandy periodic table of elements, though we may not refer to this a lot in AP Biology. Um, and you'd normally be given the information you need for calculations. Um, periodic table is not part of your formula sheet. It's still an incredibly useful tool for chemical elements, and they're ordered by their atomic number, which is the number of protons, and their electron configurations, and other chemical properties. So you'll see more of this in your chemistry class, or you might have seen it already in your chemistry class, but today we're just taking a quick look. Now, fun fact, this version is actually in French, and if you look closely, um, some of the elements, though they all share the same symbols in different languages, may have different names. So you probably can't see it, but nitrogen, for example, is called nitrogen in English and represented by the symbol N. In French, it is called azote, and it is still represented by the symbol N, which is pretty cool. So all languages use the same symbols for our different elements. Let's talk about atoms. So all elements are substances made um, entirely from one type of atom. Um, and atoms, of course, are the building blocks of all matter. Now atoms are made of three things, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So our protons have a positive charge, our neutrons have a neutral charge, and our electrons have a negative charge. Now again, atoms are the building blocks of all matter, but these three particles are going to make up the atoms. Electrons have virtually no mass, and they orbit around our atom's nucleus, and they are negatively charged. Okay, so protons and neutrons, um, protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, they're going to make up the nucleus of the atom, and they're what gives the atom its atomic mass. To get the atomic mass, we add together the protons and neutrons. Carbon has six each, so the atomic mass is 12. We'll come back to that later, so stay tuned. Now, the main elements we'll start with this year are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And you can remember this by CHNUPS or CHNUPS. Um, and these basically are the symbols for the six most abundant elements in living organisms. So there are about 94-ish elements that occur naturally um, on Earth, and the rest can be created in a laboratory setting. Um, cool fact about the periodic table, which we just looked at, it predicted elements that should exist before they were even discovered based on their chemical properties, which is really cool. But back to these six, they are some of the most important in living systems. So all of these elements occur in things like our plants here, our Gallus domesticus, our chicken, as well as different bacteria. This is a type of um, gram-negative uh, pneumonia bacteria, not the type that causes us illness, um, and it generally is going to um, be part of our natural intestines and microbiome. So um, we'll go back to these uh, elements a lot. Um, carbon, again, found in all organic molecules. It's the most, the sixth most abundant element in the universe. Um, hydrogen, of course, is in water. Humans are made of mostly water. Nitrogen is so abundant in the air, um, so about 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, so we're breathing in a lot of nitrogen every time we take an inhalation. Of course, oxygen is really important as well. We need oxygen for processes like cellular respiration. And phosphorus is going to be be received by organisms um, in different processes. We'll talk about the cycle with phosphorus. And of course, sulfur is necessary for all living cells in our body. And generally, we get sulfur by consuming plants. All right. So other important elements that we can talk about. So um, there are a lot of other elements that are important in living processes, things like sodium and potassium and calcium. Um, they're going to be important as ions, and we'll get to what ions are in a second. Um, so this will happen in nerve functioning and other biological signaling. Um, but don't forget our big six, which we just saw here. All right, so let's go back and talk about electrons. Remember, the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom, so right here they're not really represented, but the electrons will orbit. So we also have what are called electron shells, or these are special regions where the electrons orbit. So in this slide, we have a simple diagram of aluminum, and the electron shells are at various distances from the nucleus, sort of like the different orbits in our solar system. And the behaviors of our electrons will determine what bonds this atom makes with other atoms, um, as well as its shape. 
So in the first shell, you can have up to two electrons. So one, two, it's full. And the second can have up to eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one is full as well. So let's take a look at carbon. So this is a Bohr model of a carbon atom. And you'll see that the first shell is full, one, two, remember, two electrons. But the second shell is not full. We've got one, two, three, four. So again, the second can take up to eight. Because of those, we'll call these empty spots for now, because of those empty spots, carbon can make up to four bonds with other atoms. Pretty neat. So this is part of why carbon plays such an important role in biological molecules, life processes, and our bodies, because it can bond so much, and it does. So let's talk really quickly about isotopes. So isotopes are atoms of one element that vary only in the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So if we go back and look at our neutrons, again here in this model, um, we see our neutrons are represented by these blue spheres. And so if we change the number of neutrons here, we would have what's called an isotope. All right, let's go back to isotopes. So, for example, uh, carbon-12 and carbon-14 are isotopes of each other. Um, with an atomic mass of 12, Carbon has six neutrons and six protons in the nucleus. But with carbon-14, carbon has six protons and eight neutrons. Now, if you change in the number of protons, you'd have an entirely different element. But we're going to stick by just changing neutrons while we talk about isotopes. So you might have heard of carbon-14 dating. Um, these, uh, this is a radioactive isotope. So radioactive isotopes, like carbon-14, are going to decay exponentially. So the half-life is uh, of an isotope is defined as the amount of time it takes for there to be half the initial amount of the radioactive isotope present. So you can determine how long ago an organism died by knowing the amount of carbon-14 in fossil remains and looking at the carbon-14 ratio for a living organism, which is pretty cool. And we'll talk about that when we talk about origin of life and history of life on Earth. Time to talk about bonds. So not James Bond, we're talking about electrons. So electrical attraction or um, the sharing of electrons is going to lead to bonds. Um, and we'll talk about how energy is released as bonds are made and how some elements gain more stable configurations through bonding. So first two main types of bonds we're going to talk about are ionic and covalent. Remember, ionic bonds are going to be the transfer of electrons between atoms. Um, so covalent bonds are going to be bonds where atoms are sharing electrons. So there's a difference. Now with ionic, Sometimes we're going to end up with ions as well, and ions are atoms where we have gained or lost electrons. So, for example, a sodium ion is very common in our bodies, as would be a calcium ion. And any ion that has lost an electron is called a cation, and it now has a positive charge. So I like to think of like a happy little cat when I think of cations. A cat is positive, it's happy, it has lost electrons. This is my weird way of remembering it. You find your way. An anion has gained electrons, so it's become more negative, and it gets more of a negative charge. Now, let's talk about covalent again. Carbon is a really good example of an element that would have a lot of covalent bonds, like we talked about earlier with our uh, atomic structure. Um, in a covalent bond, each atom contributes one electron of an electron pair. So you're looking at a methane molecule here. There are a lot, there are these um, four covalent bonds that carbon is making with hydrogen. And there are a lot of covalent bonds in our organic compounds, which we'll talk about later as well. So really quickly, let's talk about polar versus nonpolar. A polar molecule is where one part of the molecule is more negative than the other part of the molecule. And we can say this is unbalanced. So what happens is the electrons are drawn to one nucleus a little bit more than the other, and we have um, this unbalanced charge. Um, generally, polar molecules are going to be hydrophilic, and nonpolar molecules are going to be hydrophobic. Now, a nonpolar bond is symmetrical, meaning the charge is balanced. Um, ethane is an example of this. Almost uh, all lipids are going to be nonpolar as well. Uh, I didn't find a good picture of a nonpolar molecule, but I did find a weird polar bear in a bubble. So there you go. Um, so again, most lipids are going to be hydrophobic as they are nonpolar. Um, but with our phospholipids, we have hydrophobic tails and um, hydrophilic heads because of the phosphate parts. So when we talk about biology and polar and nonpolar, we'll talk about how the properties of water, which is a polar molecule, are going to really affect how a lot of life processes occur. And certain proteins are going to be embedded in cell membranes that can be polar and hydrophilic or nonpolar and hydrophobic. Um, this also can apply to how proteins fold and form their structure. Remember, structure di dictates 
function. So what they do. And then different amino acids will have different chemical properties and they can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic depending on their molecular structure. While we're talking about cell transport, membranes are set up as a um, uh, barrier to polar molecules. So these large hydrophilic polar molecules that need to get across the membrane will have to do so with the help of an embedded channel or um, transport protein. So we'll get into that a lot this year. All right, hydrogen bonds really quickly. These are um, when we have a polar covalent bond containing hydrogen, the hydrogen gets a slightly positive charge because the electrons are pulled more strongly towards the other element. Because of this slight positive charge, the hydrogen is going to be attracted to the neighboring negative charges. And so this interaction is called a hydrogen bond. We have these a lot. They are very common. And water molecules, we're going to see them a lot. And of course, in an individual hydrogen bond is a pretty weak bond, but lots of these together can be particularly strong. And an important place in biology where we see hydrogen bonds are going to be the bonds holding our double-stranded DNA together. So if we zoom in on our DNA molecule, you'll notice we have hydrogen bonds in between our different nitrogen bases, which is so cool. Okay, real quick, um, a note on hydrogen ions. So remember, an ions gain or lose an electron. When we have a positive hydrogen ion, so we have lost an electron, it is now positive, we sometimes refer to these as just protons, since the hydrogen's atomic mass is just one. It's only made of one proton, um, and when it's not an ion, one electron. If it loses that electron, it's a hydrogen ion or just a proton. So we're going to see these positive hydrogen ions or protons come into play when we talk about cellular respiration and the nitty-gritty of that process. So there's going to be uh, the formation of a proton gradient that drives the synthesis of ATP and uh, just warning, cellular respiration in AP biology is about to get a lot more complicated. All right, real quick, I have a whole video on the pH scale, and I'll post that in the links below. But in quick terms, pH is a way to measure the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution, how acidic or how basic a solution is. Um, pH scale is logarithmic. Uh, it goes from 0 to 14, and we'll talk more about it later. Now, functional groups, I will mention, I also have a video on this, so we'll watch that again later, but these are groups of atoms that are consistently found together in different biological molecules. So because I have a whole video on this too, I'm not going to touch on them too much, but they're important to review and recognize, and they'll determine how molecules work and what interactions will occur. Briefly, organic compounds are basically what all living organisms are made of. They all contain carbon. There are four main groups of organic compounds. These are proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. And real quick introduction to chemical equations. If you have not seen these before, if you forgot from chemistry, we have our reactants over here, and then we have uh, this arrow, which means yield, and then we have our products over here. Now, in AP Biology, I'm not going to ask you to balance equations or to do any stoichiometry necessarily, but we will be able to uh, we will need to uh, recognize what comes in and what comes out of a chemical uh, reaction. Now, chemistry is integral to biology, and we're going to be continuing to weave it throughout the course of this year. Up next, um, we're going to also have to review other topics, such as water potential, uh, molar concentration, dilution, uh, more pH and how uh, it works, um, and different solution concentrations, hypertonic, isotonic solutions. So all of that will be coming up. Thanks, guys, for sticking with me through quick and dirty chemistry.